classes in polymer dynamics based on George Philly's book, Phenomenology of Polymer Solution Dynamics, Cambridge University Press, 2011. And today, this lecture is Lecture 25, Viscoelasticity. I'm Professor Phillies, and today we're going to continue our discussion of polymer viscoelasticity. After we stopped taping last time, we had this very interesting class discussion on how we found, or managed to find, the temporal scaling on Zots and where the whole model that has sort of been hiding implicitly under all of the phenomenology came from. And so I'll add in some comments on that toward the end of the lecture. What I'm going to do, though, is to discuss first where we are, where we are advancing to, and what we found so far. So what we did was to discuss viscoelastic properties as actually measured. And we looked at results on the loss modulus and the storage modulus, and we looked at results on shear thinning. Uh, the experimental outcome is that we have two set of all of these measurements, and we have a theoretical approach, temporal scaling, that reduces all of those functions to a small number of parameters. Now, one thing you might legitimately ask is, well, it's very nice to say we have a small number of parameters here, but the, there is still the key question, um, do those parameters say anything sensible, or are they sort of randomly scattered over the entire universe? One way to answer that question is to take, look at the parameters and to ask how the parameters depend on solution properties, how they depend on polymer concentration, polymer molecular weight, and other ish things that one could measure. In doing that, note that the viscoelastic measurements, while they're carried, tip, in some cases are carried out to the melt, are largely reported for fairly concentrated solutions not tending down towards zero concentration. And therefore, the measurements we looked at are a little limited in some respects in terms of which concentrations they point at. That's not always true, and if you look hard, there's some that get down to fairly low concentration. So what we can do is, for example, well, let us recall what functions we have been using to fit the measurements. And so the general form for either of the moduli is normalized by frequency. That is either g prime over omega square or g double prime over omega have been fit by something which is a gi zero e to the minus a omega to the delta. And that's up to some frequency omega c. And then at higher frequencies, there is a g bar i omega to the minus x. <clears throat> there are two storage moduli, and there, or at, well, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. There is a storage modulus, there is a uh, loss modulus, and because there are now two moduli, there are actually two sets of these parameters that we can look at. If we start by looking at G10 or G20 as a function of concentration, we see that as a function of concentration, and this is all in figure 13.33, what you see is power law behavior. The power law behavior extends down from the melt a fair distance, but not absolutely all the way to zero. And then, in at least some systems, there's a trailing off below. Um, we should recognize that G, that's the omega equal, goes to zero limit of GW prime over omega. That's a viscosity. And therefore, we are looking at systems that are in the melt-like regime, 
That is, we are looking at things in which the viscosity has gone over from a stretched exponential concentration dependence, which is always found at low concentrations, to a power law concentration dependence, which is sometimes found, but not always found at higher concentrations. We can also look at <clears throat> alpha versus concentration. And what we see for alpha versus concentration is again power laws. The linear polymers have a weaker dependence of alpha on concentration. The star polymers have a stronger dependence of alpha on concentration. Uh, finally, if we look at the exponent delta, this exponent, what we see is that for linear polymers, typically delta stays fairly close to 1. And for star polymers, if concentration is increased, delta falls off. We could, I could go into considerably more detail by putting the slides up one at a time, but that's certainly the sort of results we're talking about. Uh, on the same line, we could then ask, well, gee, what happened? Where is the cutoff frequency? There's a cutoff frequency that transitions us from the low frequency region to the large frequency region. And if we plot the cutoff frequency versus concentration, <coughs> what we see is that as we increase the concentration, the cutoff frequency falls. And fairly consistently, these things are fairly close to power laws. Now, in some cases, I, we say, yeah, these are close to power laws, but you legitimately ask, but what range of the power law are you seeing? Uh, and the answer is, in some cases, you're not seeing a great deal, and you might be able to fit to something else. And in other cases, you're fairly clearly covering a decent range. Um, it is also the case that you might wish for significantly more points on a single curve. Uh, you should realize how much work is involved here. That is, to get to this point, you start off by measuring the storage and loss modulus at some frequency. And you repeat this measurement many, many times at a whole series of frequencies. And now you have done one solution. And then you can fit, the, you then can fit and extract the parameters from this functional form. And you now have on each of these graphs, on the, as a result of many experiments, you have one parameter. Uh, you notice that there is a lot of work here. Now, to some extent, you can hope to avoid this by the simple expedient of um, automation, which is much more practical than it was 20 or 40 years ago. I mean, there are even people, and we can go back 20 years on this, or 30 years, who were experimenting on automation of, aut of organic synthesis. Um, <clears throat> but the net result of all this is that you might like more points, but there is a huge amount of work to get to what you see. Nonetheless, the cutoff frequency does indeed fall with increasing concentration. Um, it falls more slowly with linear polymers. It falls more rapidly with star polymers. OK. So let us perhaps chug ahead a bit. And let us ask, what happens at higher frequencies? That's lower frequencies. At larger frequencies, we have power law behavior. And there are two sorts of things we could plot. And we could plot g bar n n is 1 or 2. And that's the, um, that's not exactly a physical number. g bar n is the value 
that the modulus as normalized by frequency would have at unit frequency if you had power law behavior into unit frequency. Of course, you don't have power law behavior into unit frequency, and therefore this particular number um, is perhaps not quite what you want. You could imagine, it's not what I happen to have done in the book, plotting instead g bar i omega at the cutoff at the transition to the minus x, and then omega over omega cutoff to the minus x, and you could call this, I don't know, g double prime, g double bar. And therefore, you would actually give the value of the modulus at the frequency at which there is a uh, transition. That would be perfectly legal to do. It would be a little harder to, it would be a little le trickier to fit because you would probably, having done a great deal of nonlinear least squares fitting, you would probably find the fitting process was a little um, more insistent that you give it decent starting parameters or you get off and you might get divergences. Okay, so what do you find this thing does? The answer is it increases with increasing concentration. <clears throat> and if you actually go back to the original figure, the original data of say Colby at all, beautiful measurements, you may remember you saw something that looked like this. Curves do not cross each other. The um, stretched exponential parts, if extrapolated, do. And so what is happening is we are moving up. We are moving the rollover of the low frequency to lower frequencies. But we are not doing it so fast that these curves interpenetrate. And what is, del what is, the, slope of what is the slope here? The slope there is delta. It's an omega to the minus delta. So we can ask, well, that, OK. So what does delta look like as a function of concentration? And the answer is that delta climbs, starts off at lower concentration, tends to an asymptote, and for um, Delta 1, the delta corresponding to the storage modulus, you get up to about 1.9, roughly. Uh, for delta corresponding to the loss modulus, you get up to something like 1.25. Now, those are the slopes for g prime over omega squared and g w prime over omega. If you were actually looking at the two curves, the or actual g prime or g w prime, g double prime itself, uh, what you would say is that this is uh, not omega to the minus 1.9. It's omega to something very close to 0, but slightly negative. And this would be omega not to the 1.25. This would be omega to the um, 0.25, and it would be very slightly climbing. We'll come back to the pretty pictures those match in a bit. OK, so that's the concentration dependence. We can also talk about the molecular weight dependence. And the molecular weight dependence takes us up a forward a couple of figures, if I recall correctly, to about 13.35. Uh, the molecular weight dependence results are a little constrained in that there's not quite as much information as you would like. There is very nice information at 641 gram per liter of an F equals 6 star. And there is nice information um, going down a bit. <clears throat> 
on um, a linear polymer, but there's not quite as many results that we can point at where there was, were a lot of different molecular weights done at fixed concentrations. Nonetheless, uh, what do we see? Well, GI0 is going to climb with increasing molecular weight. Uh, we are in the melt-like regime where we see a power law behavior, and we saw that for concentration, and here we also see it for molecular weight. I should redraw this slightly. For the star polymer, the slope is relatively steep. For the linear polymer, the slope is less pronounced, though present. <clears throat> we can also look at alpha versus M. And again, we see something close to power law behavior. Uh, the best I can say for delta is that there are lots of values of delta. They're two, two moduli. There are a certain <coughs> number of samples. There were a bunch of molecular, and we can look at versus molecular weight. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of values of delta, but I didn't see any easy generalizations. OK. What else do we see? Well, there are two more parameters here, aren't there? Yes. There's g bar i and there's x. And if we look at g bar i for the molecular weight dependence, um, That's certainly well defined. If we look at G bar i and the molecular weight dependence, well, you see a result. And the best that can be said, <coughs> if you want to say it's power law behavior, is that it's a rather weak power law because the variation in G bar i with m over the observed range of m is not very large. And therefore, your ev your, if you want to say it's power law, your evidence isn't as strong as you might like. For x, you see something slightly <clears throat> peculiar. And it's a little more, I will emphasize, this is a linear scale for x and an exponential scale for m or if you prefer a log scale. And there are nice lines on the plot. And therefore, we can say that x is proportional to log of the molecular weight. And the slope is very weak. It's not flat. And that leads us to recalling it's omega to the minus x here, we have something that is omega to the minus some constant. Oh, there's an additive constant, too. Log m. And you, if you have something of that slightly unusual structure, you can rearrange it. And you can arrange it to say that it is m to the log omega. There's some constants. Um, but I'm not sure what, if anything, that tells you. It's a rearrangement. Nonetheless, if you look, actually go and look at the figures, what you see is we can extract parameters out of them. The parameters we extract out are typically fairly well behaved in the sense they show smooth dependences on the solution properties that you think ought to be determining them. And therefore, in some sense, you're getting a quantitative description. Now, having said there's a quantitative description, you ask, OK, you have a quantitative description. What good is a quantitative description? And there are three sorts of goods. The first is that if you actually have a quantitative description, and you can say how the fitting parameters depend on concentration and molecular weight, you now can use the fitting parameter behavior 
and measurements at some number of points, and you can use them as interpolants. You can use them to calculate the storage and loss moduli at polymer concentrations and molecular weights that are not the same as the concentrations and molecular weights that you actually studied experimentally. Uh, that's a, that can, is potentially quite useful. I emphasize there's a lot of work required to do these measurements. And if you have a good set of interpolating functions, you can significantly reduce how many experiments you need to perform to get the measurements you want. But the second point is <clears throat> that if you discover you know how these various parameters depend on concentration, molecular weight, solvent quality, whatever, those are clues. Those are clues as to how you take the theory and you push it ahead to the next step. They don't tell you what the theory is, but they are hints from Mother Nature as to what you ought to be doing. Finally, if you do manage to cook up a model that, and a detailed calculation that actually explains what you are finding, which may happen at some point, if you are able to do this, you have a result. Namely, you can take the experiments and actually use them to test your model and see if it works or not. And so, the phenomenological approach I've outlined here actually has three sorts of uses. Okay, now we're going to change topic entirely. We are going to talk about the chronic Cromer's relations. Chronic Cromer's relations are a statement about relationship between time response and loss modulus and storage modulus they're in a certain sense a mathematical relationship that must hold because the system is linear. So let us consider what we mean by that. And we start with g of t, nu g, which is the shear stress relaxation function. And what the shear stress relaxation function does is to consider the following. Here's the time axis. And we have ideal test, two infinite plates. And we displace one of the plates some amount very, very fast. And once we've done that, we ask what force is acting on the upper plate. And what we find is the force is zero until we displace the upper plate. And then there is a spike. And then there's some sort of a relaxation whose details I am not giving you at the moment. But there is a relaxation. And if you look very hard as you are moving the plate, you can also ask how you manage to get up here. Now the next statement is, system is linear, and therefore if we are making a motion of the plates, we can de decompose the motion of the plates into a large number of steps, and each step separately creates, at the time it happens, its own change in the shear stress. Okay. <clears throat> so we go in and we could imagine making a second step and a third step, or you could make a whole series of steps in the form of a cosine wave or a sine wave. So we're saying we have a linear system, and therefore it must be the case that the response of the um, 
system to a sinusoidal oscillation and to a linear oscillation, a step uh, um, motion, must be calculable from each other. The last piece is causality. That is, G is supposed to be zero if you are at times less than zero because you should not have a response force before you've moved the plates. If you do, you can use this to construct, at least if not a time machine, a device that lets you communicate backwards in time. And now I will make the point, this is the results of Kronig and Cromers, two separate authors, two separate papers, that that statement lets me calculate G of T either from G prime over omega square or from G double prime over omega. There are a large number of different ways of writing this, but let's see. Integral 0 to infinity d omega, this is a function of omega, and then you have omega sine omega t d omega. Or we can do an integral 0 to infinity d omega of g double prime over omega. And there is a cosine omega t d omega. These are frequency time transforms. They're invertible. And so you, if you tell, I tell you what g of t is, I have told you what g prime and g double prime both are. Correspondingly, if we look at g prime and g double prime, they're not independent. That is, if I start with either of them, I can calculate g of t. And then from g of t, I can turn around and calculate the other of them. And if you want, you can eliminate the middleman and presumably calculate one from the other now, can't you? OK, so we can do this calculation. And the chronic Cromer's relations are a self-consistency result. There is, however, a constraint on the chronic Cromer's relations if you actually want to use it like this. Namely, you need to know the, loss, the storage modulus or the loss modulus out to infinite frequency because the upper bounds on these two integrals are infinity. Well, if you're actually doing physical measurements, you can cover four orders of magnitude in frequency. If you do time temperature superposition, you can do seven orders of magnitude in frequency. But what you know is that the full, there's a reasonable estimate as to what the full function should look like, namely, initial stretched exponential regime, power law regime, and someplace out here, if we're looking at the loss modulus, there should be a rollover because in the end the solvent has a viscosity and that viscosity does not depend on frequency until you get way, way out there. And, there. and in between there may be, let's see, we saw several deviations from a simple power, added power law there may be some structure. Well, if you only measure up to here, you can't see the structure, which is an issue. But if you measure far enough down, the functional fits, in essence, have another use. Namely, the functional forms work quite well. And therefore, you can use the functional forms as extrapolants to cover into regions you did not see. Also, if the functional forms are reasonable, they describe the measurements accurately, and the noise in individual measurements is smoothed out when you use a good fitting function. Which obeys Kramer's Which obeys a chronic Kramer's fitting function. That's quite correct. The, you can now have something that extrapolates and is smooth that you can put into the chronic Cromer's relations. Well, that's actually done.
and it's figure 13.39. And if you look at 13.39, there are measurements of the um, g prime and g double prime, and they have been used to compute g of t. And this is all done for one polymer at a series of concentrations. And if you look, you see a curve that rolls over. And there's another line, which is G of T calculated from the other storage modulus, and it rolls over. <clears throat> and except very near the two ends, this works just fine. It's quite accurate. Right close to the two ends, things start to get noisy. And the if you look at the times at which you start to see issues, the times at which you start to see issues correspond to the upper and lower frequencies at which g of omega was measured. That is, the extrapolant does a nice job of smoothing the ends curves out for you, but you really didn't do measurements out to very high frequencies, at least in that, those results. And therefore, when you get into the region where you didn't do measurements in frequency space, uh, the time domain numbers get a little more noisy. <coughs> Okay, those are the chronic Cromer's relations. Uh, what can we say about them? Well, first of all, there are, it's a physical result, so you should certainly be convinced that the original measurements as found in the original papers, if you actually looked at the storage and loss modulus, the original numbers must have obeyed the chronic Cromer's relations. There's no, absolutely no reason to doubt that. When we went here, what we did was to say, we will take the fitting functions and we will use the fitting functions and the parameters we determined to calculate analytically what g of t is. And those calculations were done. And when you do those calculations, you get the curve seen in the figure. If the chronic Cromer's relations had not been satisfied, if the two curves were not right on top of each other, there would be a very strong message that something was wrong with your fits. And furthermore, it was something at the level of, does the fit describe the measurement reasonably? I mean, the original data did, should have done this so far as we know. And therefore, when you have the fits, which seem to map, give you curves right through the data, and I'm going to emphasize that much more in a bit, um, gee, it should work, and it does. If it didn't, something would be really wrong. <clears throat> OK. Now we come to the next section of the book. And the next section of the book is on optical flow by refringence. Uh, Biorefringence is the notion that if I have a material object and I send a ray of light through it, I can send through linearly polarized light, say vertically or horizontally polarized. If the sample is birefringent, there are a few crystals that are birefringent. I think Iceland spar comes to mind. Uh, birefringent means that the index of refraction is not the same for one light polarization as for the other. Um, this phenomenon was known to ancient Norse navigators. They had a device, the sunstone, you looked at the sky through it in a completely cloudy day, and you could tell where the sun was. And the reason you could tell where, what, where the sun was was that the, the light that is scattered through clouds, even if you can't see the sun, picks up a polarization because of the way the scattering works. And experimentally, someone went out in a boat and tried this. You can actually estimate the sun height with some reasonable precision 
because you can tell where the polarizations are po pointing at the sun location. I'm not going to swear it competes with the magnetic compass. Except in the far north where far magnetic compasses are not very useful because the Earth's magnetic field is somewhat vertical. In um, any event, that is by refringence. Now the next thing is, is that you have a system and you share it or you do something similar to it and you line up the polymer chains. Now what exactly, well there are a lot of ways to do the experiment and the net general notion is for example you apply an oscillatory shear and you get transient alignment of the molecules and once you have persuaded the molecules to line up well they don't stay lined up they try to relax to random directions but once you've done some sort of arrangement of the molecules you now have a system that is optically active in a way that gives you birefringence. We then have the stress optical rule. The idea here, which is, is that you can describe this, we will align the molecules and we see relaxation. And so we are applying a driving, it's technically not a force, a driving effort that is cosine omega t. And the response has an in-phase component, which you should, sounds just like the storage modulus, and an out-of-phase component, which sounds very much like the loss modulus. And these two should be the same. These two should be the same as the corresponding objects that you find if you do dynamic shear measurements. Now, that says something about the system. Uh, namely, it says that what you are seeing optically corresponds to what is causing the polymer to show its viscoelastic behavior. They can't just be uncoupled variables. They have to be the same variables. And uh, what is traditionally done, if you look in the literature, is that you report an amplitude S, and you report a, a phase delta. Because if you have two components in phase and out of phase, that's the same as one component with a phase angle. That's simply the statement that you can write a complex number as an amplitude and a phase. That's a math statement. And therefore, these two ought to be related. And in fact, I give an example where I took data on optical flow by refringence measurements, replotted them from this form to something that corresponds to this. And if you plot them versus frequency, you see something that looks very familiar. I confess, however, that this section of a book, book was an extreme disappointment. Uh, the primary issue, since there was a certain amount of writing effort here, and the writing effort became time consuming, was that I was really not successfully able to find an entry point in the literature that revealed solution data. There's a very considerable amount of melt data on uh, optical flow by refringence through groups at Stanford and Caltech and a few number of those are the places that come immediately to mind, and there are some very good people who work on it. Uh, however, um, it would seem to all the stuff I found were melt measurements. And since I decided not to cover melts, there wasn't much to talk about. I have the distinct suspicion that sooner or later someone is going to send a polite email. Here is where you should have looked. Here is the obvious set of search words to use in Web of Science. And you would have found a whole chapter full of results. Well, I didn't. It was almost as frustrating as uh, pulsed field gradient NMR, where um, in principle, you can use um, NMR studies to look not only at 
translational diffusion, but also at segment motions. And you do find the discussion way back in, oh, about chapter six, where we, there are some NMR studies of segmental motions. But I have the distinct impression that, once again, there was something I didn't quite find. Nonetheless, there is such a technique, and there is a section on it. Okay, what is next? General results. Well, first I am going to talk about a picture. And I'm going to point out some terminology. And we'll start by talking about G of T, the stress relaxation as a function of time. And so we do something to the system, and we look at the response, and we ask what the response shows us. And what we find for G of T is there is what we call a glassy region, and then there is a transition, and there, then there is what is called a plateau. And eventually, if you go out to sufficiently high frequencies, there's a terminal region. And the terminal region is the response going down to the point where you look as a function of frequency. And basically, what you see is the solvent. Let's turn this around. And let us put this in frequency domain. And I will show you the plot as it is traditionally done, where you plot G prime or G double prime itself, and not normalized by frequencies. And you have a takeoff. And the takeoff is what is called the terminal regime. And if you are plotting it in frequency domain, you might wonder, why is it called terminal, the end? The answer is that in time domain, it's terminal. In frequency domain, well, you know, high frequencies correspond to short, excuse me, long times correspond to low frequencies. And then there is a rollover, and we get into the plateau. And if we get out here far enough, there is a transition. And then there is the glass. And if you refer back to the previous lecture, I do a one figure where I take the onsatz and I replot everything in this form. And I show that the uh, low frequency stretch exponential regime gives me a curve that looks like that. And someplace in here is the omega c. And beyond omega c, the power law regime plus additive stuff at high frequencies gives me a curve that actually matches the measurements quite nicely. And the curve uses a small number of parameters whose behavior is known. So this glassy transition plateau terminal terminology des not describes nicely time domain. The next point I would make is that if you start off with a solution and go to a polymer and you make the concentration and molecular weight large, higher and higher, this plateau gets longer and longer. That is, you have a final relaxation. Oh, I should emphasize, this is log t. If you plot linear in t, it's much less impressive because you cannot both see the fine detail at short times and see what's happening at long times. And therefore, what happens is you increase the molecular weight. Uh, the terminal time moves out as a, consider as a power of the molecular weight. And that is a general behavior of the system. <clears throat> OK, so there are the 
time and frequency domain pictures. It's the same picture in sort of in symmetry. And in addition, um, there is the traditional nomenclature that's used for the regimes. Okay, so having said we've done that, what do we find experimentally? Well, in the first point we could say about experimentally, we're now going to advance to 13.7 general results. And the first point I would make is that temporal scaling works. It works extremely well. If you go back to the early figures in the chapter, there are plots of the storage and loss modulus which cover a considerable number of powers of 10 in frequency and which show considerable decay over a number of powers of 10. And over that you have the lines, and the lines go right through the points. It's not there's a, a line with a, a set of points which say has a smooth, very gentle curve and we try to fit a power law to it. It's the lines go through the point. So temporal scaling works very well. Furthermore, there was the prediction, here is the behavior at low frequencies, here is the crossover to higher frequencies, <clears throat> the stretched exponential curve continues like this, the power law curve continues like this, and at the transition, the transition is very clearly smooth. <coughs> There's no bump, and it's analytic. That is, the first derivative is quite clearly continuous, where we cross over from one to the other. So there is, there's, there are very few cases in which you see a little bit of a gap the power law being higher. And the question is, why do you see a gap? And one answer is, well, maybe you need to improve the model in some cases slightly and insert a bridge function, a very small bridge function. And the other answer is, um, if you have something that is doing something at large frequencies, and as a result your curve is not quite as simple as you thought it was, uh, the, when you get up to here, there will be a very small deviation. For example, there's extra activity in the data and that displaces the best fit power law up a tiny bit. And uh, the, I'm not going to make any explanation as to which it is or try to rationalize it away. I'm just saying there is a limit. At large frequency, we do see some pheno additional phenomena. And one choice is we curve over to an additive constant, which sort of corresponds to the um, solvent. And another possibility is we see two power laws additive. But each of those power laws is covered over a decent number of orders of magnitude. Uh, so it's fairly clear they really are power laws. And this region region right at the crossover really is well described if you assume the two power laws are simply additive. And finally, in some systems, we see what appears to be an additive exponential bump as if something was happening um, that gave you an extra relaxation out the higher frequencies. Oh, and there isn't a lot of content of um, continuation down here to say exactly what happens at la really large frequencies. We see the, um, ex the additive, say, exponential relax, but I can't tell you whether it relaxes into increasing the power law or comes back to the original power law curve. Uh, the measurements just aren't quite there. After all, if you didn't know they were interesting, why would you do them? It's very hard work. Okay, so that's the frequency dependence. Um, there are a series of fitting parameters, G10, G20, 
alpha for each storage and loss modulus, delta one for each, omega cutoff one for each, and then there is a G bar I zero and an X. So there are sort of six parameters. Well, maybe we should count this as one parameter, in which case there are five parameters, one set each for the storage and loss modulus. The cutoff frequency is not exactly an independent parameter. The reason it's not exactly an ind independent parameter is that if I tell you what these three are, and I tell you the slope here, yes, and I tell you that when we cross over from one to the other, uh, the slope and the um, altitude have to be consistent, that constrains what some of these parameters are. So there really aren't quite that many free parameters, but I show all of them because it's not quite clear which should be viewed as the independent free parameters and which are sort of along for the ride. Um, the behavior of these parameters on the solution properties is that we see power laws and therefore from power laws in many cases we have exponents of the power laws which become a theoretical target. Um, we don't always see power laws. X is a straight line with gentle slope of plotted against log m. Um, so there is a behavior which is at least smooth and consistent. Okay, is this good or bad? Well, I am going to find two quotations from the book. Okay. And so we have a quote, this is now going back a quarter of a century, uh, Ferry discussing the um, dependence on concentration and molecular weight. It is evident that the concentration reduction scheme for the transition zone described above, that's in his review article, is referenced in, chapter, in the introduction, cannot be applied in the plateau zone and indeed that no simple method for combining data at different concentrations can exist. The shapes of the viscoelastic function change significantly with dilution. Well, as I have just shown you, while there are changes in shape, it is possible to describe them as concentration and molecular weight, dependence was with the fitting parameters, and therefore it is indeed possible to unite data at different shapes. Now combine, when Ferry wrote it, had a slightly different meaning. Ferry was thinking in terms of reduction plots. That is, you change the scale of the frequency with a concentration dependent function, or you change the vertical scale with a concentration dependent function, and the curves just lie on top of each other. That actually works reasonably well for viscosity, for example as a function of molecular weight. Well, Ferry was saying the reduction approach does not work here. We've shown something better than the reduction approach that really does work. <coughs> okay. There is, if I remember to bring it, another quote here. Um, where'd it go? It's right in front of me. Well, I thought it was right in front of me. And the other quote, which is from the Pearson Review, goes in essence that if you dilute things, it is obscure what is going on. The obscurity has now been lifted. We can now show you, quant at least in a descriptive sense, what is happening. Okay. There is one difference between what has been done here and what has been done in all earlier parts of the book that I really want to emphasize. In earlier parts of the book where we were talking about, for example, the self-diffusion coefficient or the viscosity, we took the standard viscoelastic, standard transport parameters, 
as actually found in the literature. We took the transport parameters that are actually in the literature and we did an analysis in terms of universal scaling forms. Here, we said we're going to replace the standard literature functions with two new functions, GW prime over omega square and G prime over o G double prime over omega. And we are going to analyze our new forms in terms of what we know. Now, of course, this one isn't exactly new because GW prime over omega as omega goes to zero is the viscosity. And if we're interested in the viscosity, you'd think that we would like the viscosity and GW prime over omega to be consistent, which means you have to analyze in terms of GW prime over omega. And once you've done that, it's also sensible to analyze in terms of G prime over omega squared. The real motivation of using the, these, though, is slightly additional motivation is slightly different. Namely, we have something plotted against omega. The reasonable expectation, if you have a transport parameter that is dependent on frequency, is that the intrinsic transport parameter at very low frequencies shows quasi-static behavior. Uh, just as you can do electrostatics and you don't have to worry about radiation if you're at very low electromagnetic frequencies. Well, in order for that to be true, the slope as you head into zero frequency ought to be zero, and these functions have that property. The traditional g prime, g w prime, g w prime functions both go to zero at zero frequency. Okay, so what else can we say? Well, we can say one last thing, and it's an interesting correlation. And it's a correlation between alpha and G, the corresponding GI zero. And what we find if we go in is that alpha goes as GI zero. This is alpha for one uh, modulus or the other goes as the, the zero limit of the modulus to some power x. The correlation is somewhat less impressive for the um, storage and loss modulus than it turns out to be for the uh, shear thinning. However, for g prime, x is about a quarter. And for g double, prime, g double prime, x is about, roughly speaking, a half. Now that's actually a very important correlation. The reason it's an important correlation is that gi zero, which is the zero shear viscosity, is simply a concentration, is a number determined by concentration and molecular weight. And in a certain sense, the zero shear viscosity, if we're talking about G20, uh, doesn't depend on time dependent parameters. This is some, the, the parameter that gives us the lead frequency dependence, and therefore it too is also being determined by polymer concentration and molecular weight. And it, the low, therefore, the low frequency behavior is seemingly being determined by quasi-static properties. Not entirely, because there's also that parameter delta, though delta is close to one, at least for smaller polymers. Nonetheless, there is this very peculiar correlation between the zero frequency limit, which is some function of C and M, and the lead frequency dependence parameter. Uh, that's about how far I've gotten on that one. Now, you could repeat this 
we have an alpha for shear thinning. These shear thinning measurements show the same general properties that the um, viscoelastic, other viscoelastic properties do. In fact, I talked about the Cox-Mers rule, and the Cox-Mers rule tells us that eta of kappa and eta of omega, that is GW prime of omega over omega, should be the same or very close. And therefore, the parameters should be the same. And for these, we get the interesting feature and we are to figure 13.42. And figure 13.42 compares alpha with eta zero. And there are very nice straight lines, the points right on the lines. Um, the limitation, of course, is that gee, there's a material dependent part, which since different materials are different, we don't have, and we find that alpha is proportional to eta zero to the two thirds. And therefore, we can write eta of kappa, this is the shear thinning, as eta zero exponential, some constant b, which is material dependent, but it's the same at all concentrations and molecular weights, eta zero to the two thirds kappa, and the fact kappa, the exponent of kappa is pretty close to one. So we actually have a formula for the shear thinning entirely in terms of the zero shear viscosity. That ought to be a theoretical clue, but I don't really, can't really tell you what it is. Now there's another clue on that figure though. It's most visible on the top line, which is made of circles. And if you look, you'll notice that some of the circles are open and some of the circles are filled. And as is explained uh, in the lead, uh, the open and filled circles correspond to linear polymers and star polymers. Yes? You see that? Well, they correspond to linear and star polymers. And the curve for linear and star polymers we could say the value of B, they lie on the same line. That is, we replace a linear polymer with a star polymer, and so far as shear thinning is concerned, nothing happens. And you have the set of points that cover stars, and a set of points that cover linear polymers, and there's only one line there. So the topology doesn't do anything. The best fit, of course, if you look at the figure, is for poly, alpha, methyl, styrene. So you have now seen a discussion of um, shear thinning and this very peculiar correlation, which once again must sort of be a hint on how to do the calculation, if only you knew what it meant. I have about 15 minutes left. So what I am going to do is to make a few remarks on leading into the next chapter and then I'll discuss a bit how we got here. The remark on the next chapter is the next chapter is the edge of where the book was going. And the edge of where the book was going was nonlinear viscoelastic properties. So far, we've talked about linear viscoelastic properties, where if you combine a series of displacements, they add linearly, and therefore, what you see is fairly transparent. And you see things which may be frequency or shear rate dependent. Uh, in the next part, we're going to take up what are loosely described as nonlinear properties, and these actually fall into two sets. Uh, the first set arises because the pressure of the liquid, the pressure tensor, actually displays its tensor properties. And therefore, in a, a polymer liquid being sheared, the pressure this way 
the pressure this way and the pressure that way are not necessarily the same. And you actually have a pressure tensor, not a simple linear pressure. And there are a whole series of slightly odd phenomena appear, that appear that are in some sense seem to be related to this piece of the issue. There are then, secondly, a set of what I will describe as modern nonlinear uh, phenomena, and we'll actually show some of these. And these are things such as large angle oscillatory shear where we have two plates, and instead of doing this, they're doing that. Or we um, shear a fluid and stop, and we look in and ask what happens, and we see a phenomenon known as shear banding, in which uh, there are displacements in the fluid, but they're not uniform across the height of the container. Or we um, do some experiments and there's an amusing background story here that we'll get to where you, for example, apply a shear, sit around for a while, apply a second shear in the same and op or opposite direction, and ask how the system responds. And you look for deviations which, from linear behavior. Deviations are quite substantial. We could also drop in, it turns out to be a nonlinear issue, uh, discussions of what is called extensional viscosity. Okay, so I have now given the lead and I now have some modest number of minutes to explain how I got here. Uh, and the front end is that one front end, I suppose there are several front ends, and one front end was that I had for a very long time been interested in diffusion of colloids as a theoretical problem. And the traditional core question is how, does, how do the diffusion coefficients, the self-diffusion coefficient and the mutual diffusion coefficient, depend on concentration? If you go way back in time, 40 years, you can find people who believe that light scattering spectroscopy measured the self-diffusion coefficient, a mean square motion of the particles. Well, that's entirely wrong. And one of the key results of my doctoral thesis was to make emphatically clear the diffusion coefficients depend on concentration. Light scattering theory experimenters hadn't all known this. And furthermore, light scattering spectroscopy unambiguously measures the mutual diffusion coefficient. So there's then a question of how do you calculate the mutual diffusion coefficient from the known properties of the liquid. And that was something that I worked on for several decades with increasing refinement and improvement in the calculations. Uh, some of the details of that you can find in my other book, um, Elementary Lectures in Statistical Mechanics, is the last few chapters. Uh, however, that meant if in order to do this, you needed a fairly solid background in hydrodynamic interactions, which are important in these systems. Now, hydrodynamics had also been introduced in polymer theory, and the introduction in polymer theory is due to the uh, Kirkwood Reisman model for the dynamics of a single polymer chain, that is, a dilute polymer chain. And the notion of um, the dilute polymer chain, if we have a chain and if a piece of it moves, it creates a hydrodynamic wake on other parts of the chain, and that modifies how the chain moves. <clears throat> so that's the kirkwood Reisman model. Um, one natural thing to do at the time was to take the kirkwood Reisman model and extend it to treat interacting polymer coils, and you can find some people who did this. Uh, unfortunately, a major part of the emphasis, it was a very reasonable part of the emphasis, was to try to do a calculation of the viscosity as a function of concentration by treating interactions between pairs of polymer coils. If you try to do this, what you run into, if you are not careful, is that the long range nature of the hydrodynamic interaction causes the integrals you rationally set up to be divergent. <coughs> 
and therefore the theory seemed to hit a dead end. That was in the early 50s, and people didn't pursue it further. Okay, in any event, coming back to the work I was doing, I, we did quasi-elastic light scattering, and uh, very early on, about 1980, we started doing probe diffusion. And the original idea was we can measure the D of the probes, we can compare with the viscosity of simple liquids, and we can look and see if there's anything interesting. Um, I didn't, I was doing this in terms of, oh, water, water, glycerol, temperature dependence, and before we'd gotten very far into this, um, one of the graduate students who was doing her research rotation came by and spoke to various professors and spoke to me, and I'm quite sure though I didn't think of it for quite a long time afterwards, it was Allison White who suggested, well, why don't you add polymers? It's a very good idea. Now, the particular polymer she suggested would not have done well with the particular polystyrene sphere probes we had because it was the wrong charge. But that's easily fixed, and you can find poly, as she would have readily told me, we, you can easily find polyelectrolyte polymers of either charge. You can find neutral water soluble pol polymers. And so we did measurements of probe diffusion. And after a piece, it became apparent that probe diffusion follows a universal scaling form e to the minus a, c to the nu. This is for probe diffusion. You can also compare the diffusion of the probes, small or large, with the viscosity of the liquid. And what is found is that the um, viscosity of the liquid does not determine the probe diffusion coefficient even for large probes. That is, if you look at the product dt eta over the zero concentration values, goes up. The probes diffuse faster than you would expect from the viscosity. The faster than part as a practical matter is very important. If you found that the probes diffused more slowly, you would think, well, the polymer is sticking to the probes and it's increasing their size. The polymer is causing the probes to stick to each other and you are looking at the diffusion of increasingly large aggregates. But all of those effects would cause a diffusion to be too slow, and you'd see a deviation in the other direction. Fortunately, nature was not arranged like this, and it was clear we were seeing something physical rather than some dull and pointless artifact. At some point in here, uh, about 85, uh, Tim Lodge sent me a preprint of one of his studies on polymer self-diffusion. And I looked at his data, and it was immediately evident that d versus c was again a stretched exponential. <coughs> and while it took me a while to get around to, I, after a piece, was able to sit down and analyze d versus c for a substantial number of different polymers. Uh, this, got cons I, this got considerably easier this was after I got here to WPI. You had microcomputers that were available. You had nice computer resources. You had fitting programs that helped you do all of this. Um, and therefore, you could combine all of these things. And by combining all of these things, uh, it was apparent that the cell polymer self-diffusion coefficient followed a stretched exponential in viscosity. And furthermore, if you looked at the viscosity you also in general saw stretched exponential behavior. Now we had actually seen Kai Ho Lin, my one Michigan grad student, had actually seen the, the solution-like, melt-like transition, and we noted, oh, it happens and the concentration dependence goes from a stretched exponential to a power law, and that is roughly the point where the probe diffusion spectrum becomes probably bimodal, which was outside what we could do with the dynamic range of our correlator. It was a 64-channel linear correlator. We hit our dynamic range. 
And so I put all that aside because we, I didn't have the instrument. And to a certain extent, I never completely got back to it, but it was clear there was a regime, at least for um, polyacrylic acid, and if you went to too large molecular weight and too high a concentration, something complicated happened. Uh, in any event, I, about 87, I published the uh, Universal Scaling Equation paper, which attracted some attention. And since it was a bit controversial, I made a point for viscosity in particular, and also for probe diffusion data, more for viscosity, of going through the literature, result after result, and showing that if you plot eta, log eta versus log c, you see this nice smooth curve at which I could draw a line through. And the nice smooth curve did not have a straight region, a power law, there weren't power law regions. It would eventually be discovered polyacrylic, uh, excuse me, hydroxypropyl uh, cellulose, that there was a system that showed the straight line region. Uh, we got into HPC for a considerably different region, reason, namely you change the temperature and you can change the solvent quality from good to theta. And so the original interest, our interest was we can look at the good to theta polymer transition and that's straightforward to do. So Ben Ware, Syracuse, prodded me a bit that if there is an equation, there ought to be a derivation for it. And one week I sat down, I sort of had hints on where to go, and I found the derivation. And part of it was a self-similarity, that is d alpha dc proportional to constant times alpha, and showing where that came from. And then alpha the const and the constant were proportional to polymer size to a power. But that only gave me exponential, pure exponential behavior. However, back while I was at UCLA in about 78, I had sat through a series of seminars with Phil Pincus, who was studying polymers. And he was working through the Degen papers, which he thought were very important. And Dan Kibbelson, who was my postdoctoral advisor, urged me to get involved, which I dutifully did. Uh, having gotten involved in it, uh, what I, the factoid I pulled up and finally remembered was that it was known that if you took a polymer and changed its concentration, it contracted. Not much, but it contracted. And if you, and it all did this if it was big enough a polymer and it didn't do if it was small. And if you put this into here, you got a stretched exponential behavior with about the right exponent. So irrespective of increasing or decreasing concentration, it would still contract. If you um, increase the concentration of the polymer, it gets smaller. It doesn't get a lot smaller, but it gets a little smaller. <clears throat> so we put this together, um, and we, it, one of the things that we did was to analyze, and it was sort of the front end that led to this book, all sorts of things that were polymer transport properties. Um, and you can now see them in book chapters here. Uh, the other thing I did, I ra happened to run into a paper by Andy Altenberger where he discusses the po positive function renormalization group. And the point that drew my attention was that depending on where the fixed point was, you could get either a stretched exponential or a power law. My interest was very strictly at that point, the stretched exponential. And therefore, in about 98, I did a derivation, a renormalization group derivation, that leads to the stretched exponential using the first few terms of the hydrodynamic form as inputs. And uh, that actually leads to the renormalization group derivation of the concentration dependence long since published. Um, I was sort of aware of viscoelastic properties, and it, there was some point where, and I don't really recall all the details, I tried reducing these and I found the temporal scaling analysis and eventually, though it was a bit later, I found the rationale that leads to it. Uh, and it really is an onsatz. I do not have a derivation. 
Uh, I happen to have been fortunate when I was doing this and doing the calculations of, for example, viscosity versus concentration. I had come in from the hydro hydrodynamic side through colloids. That's why we have a colloid chapter. I had had some exposure to biology and went at, somewhat after I heard Annalise Barron give a talk at a Gordon conference, um, I happened to run into a paper by Rodbard and Krombach, that's an electrophoresis chapter, where they referenced one of mine and suddenly realized, gee, this is another way to do driven motion studies. Before then, the major driven motion studies I knew about were the ultracentrifuge studies, which are now a half century in the past. Uh, so in any event, things sort of came together because I happened to be in the right place at the right time and was able to bring things together. Um, we are out of time, but I have given a little bit of historical background. In our next discussion, we will, which will be next week, we will take up nonlinear viscoelastic properties. And that is it for today. <laughs>